Thanks very much, Sarah, and all of the Curve Working Group. It's fantastic the, to have Yusuf Yusufari from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as Ugo Osigwe from Afina, here today to talk about their intervention to strengthen data quality in Nigeria and improve immunization and PHC program performance. We'll first hear from Yusuf, who will provide some background and context to this intervention, and we'll then uh, discuss how Afinet worked with Gates to structure their intervention and activities with learning at the core. We're lucky to have such a fascinating case study as an exemplar following our previous session on best pra practice advice to design adaptive proposals. So I'll now hand over to Yusuf to begin his presentation. Um, um, thank you all. Um, good morning and good afternoon wherever you are around the world. Um, <clears throat> our, our presentation centered around one of the case study uh, where we, we use responsive feedback mechanism embedded into a a, a data quality improvement grant. Um, Nigeria, can you go to the next slide? Um, so, so, so in Nigeria, administrative data has remained very poor. It has essentially been of poor quality, which makes it unsuitable for policy making. Um, there have been several innovations to improve the quality of the admin data. But um, there has not been any significant result. And uh, in those innovations, um, there are no use of behavioral insights to address some of these uh, challenges. Now, for, for, for you to appreciate the data quality issues in Nigeria, you need to look at the admin data and put it in tandem with the, with the survey data. You will see that consistently, like you see in the next slide, um, you will see how that lays out. But for us, we adopted, we since, can you go back? Uh -huh. so, so what you will be, what you are seeing here is three different, go ahead. Can you scroll to the next slide? The graphs, uh -huh, exactly. So, so what you are seeing here is, the, the, the key issue with the data issue in Nigeria. The, the first graph with purple on the maps is actually the admin data which government of Nigeria reported its performance uh, for the joint reporting format with WHO and UNICEF. Um, those purple colors you see are facilities and locations that have been reporting over 100% coverage. Now, Compare that with the map in the center, which is showing, which is the survey just conducted, the latest DHIS survey, which, which shows that a lot of the facilities are actually, ha actually have coverage below 30%. But if you look at it with other modeling scenario, the modeling scenario also is more akin with with the, um, with, the, with, the, with the survey data. Now, key question to ask is, why has there consistently been huge gaps between the admin and coverage, I mean, ad, the admin and survey data? Um, for us, we've seen that over time, a lot of innovations have been put in addressing the issue, but it has focused on the technical component, I, I mean, trying to address the technical component of the problem. And we noted that um, in facilities, the same facility that is reporting this same data that is 100% is the same location that is surveyed and the coverage is shown to be below 30%. So for us, there are some fundamental things that we need to see, I mean, look at beyond the, beyond the, uh, beyond the, the technical. Now, if you go to the next slide, you will see why it's also important to adopt other insights to address this problem. And uh, uh, can you scroll to the next slide? Tom, can you scroll to the next slide? Uh -huh. So, so what, you, what we try to do to really operationalize the problem is to look at if you're using that admin data for decision making, it means that a large cohort of your target population will be missed. 
So if you look at the target population for the routine immunization program uh, in the survey, which showed an, an average of, uh, the national average of 50% uh, across states, you will see that most of the states in red are the same states that are also reporting 100% coverage in their admin data. And so you could see, uh, based on the survey, you can see the large proportion of kids that have been missed or that remain unimmunized. Now, if you use the admin data for decision making, it means you are excluding all this in your thinking around addressing coverage and equity. So, so for us, we brought the HCD lens to this conversation because we feel there are some fundamental problems with the way the problem is perceived. And therefore, we felt that this will be there will be a lot of learning as we implement HCD within the content in trying to address the data quality issues in Nigeria. Um, for us also, the, the data quality issues within the context, addressing data quality issues within the context of the HCD means that you are exploring something new that has not been implemented before. And the literature review, which Affinet team conducted, has shown that there has never been any effort previously to bring HCD lens in addressing or even other behavioral insights to address data quality in Nigeria. So, so for us, this is the crux of the matter. Data is poor of poor quality. And this is the same data that is real. Uh, I mean, this is the real time data government and its institutions has available to it. The data is of poor quality. And because it's of poor quality, it's not really the right data for decision making. But adopting a behavioral lens for us means that we, will, we are exploring something new. And if we are exploring something new, it will come with a lot of risk. It will come with a lot of learning for everybody. Um, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, so, so for us, these are the fundamental reasons why, because these are new approaches. We want to leverage global best practice. We want to identify the knowledge gaps that needs to be addressed. Uh, and therefore, um, our working assumption and hypothesis are that we need to bring in new models in thinking so that we'll be able to really address the, the problem. Um, we, we, we plan to work with Affinet because we, we funded CDD, CDC Foundation uh, through Affinet. I mean, uh, we funded Affinet through CDC Foundation to roll out the implementation of DHIS2 in Nigeria. So Affinet has deep knowledge about the technical component of data quality issues in Nigeria because they were there in the thick of it. But we also acknowledge the fact that uh, the Affinet team does not have the HCD skill set. And what we did, and, and we'll come to this conversation later, is to connect them with the global team so that they can it also serve as a learning curve for them. And as they learn, we also work together to really address the, 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 the problem. Um, we expect to learn some lessons. The next slide. Uh, we, we have some expectations in this, in this exercise. Uh, but, um, but before I give you some of those expectations, I would like to show you how we try to use responsive feedback. Um, and, and I will just take three examples, the prompt, the ability and motivations. So we'll be looking at addressing data quality issues within the various components. And for prompt, we are using some, uh, the youth, core, uh, youth, youth, youth service core members in the country, those working in Nigeria knows these people very well, and world label amb ambassadors to really prompt PHC workers to record data accurately. So what we want to do is to see whether, which of the two is better, and whether those prompts can be effective. So within this context, while we are improving data quality in, uh, uh, for decision making at various levels, we are also looking at whether prompts can be effective. So it's another learning process for us. Then we have data validation meetings that happen, which improves the ability of PHC workers to record accurately. Are those meetings effective? 
Are they really effective? Are they really meeting the objective for why those meetings are convened? And also we look at motivations. Um, we, there are some incentive packages around teams that have reduced the variance between their admin and survey, uh, significantly reduced the, the variance between admin and survey over time, and we we'll provide some incentive for them. Would these in incentives be a motivation for them? So these are some of those things we intend to explore in the process and, add, and in each section we will also try to learn uh, and, and do some learning within those contexts. And, and finally, um, the next slide. Yeah, so, so, so for us, we are, we, are, we are exploring this learning process to kind of one, provide evidence. Uh, if we implement these RFMs, it will provide evidence around which strategies work and which strategies doesn't work. And so if we learn, we'll be able to feed that learning into the strategy development and implementation. I will also see whether as we learn, we'll be able to do course correction. Now, if we learn, the lessons so uh, documented will be used to improve planning and implementation of service delivery. And of course, if we do that, it will provide us with opportunity to improve the quality of the program and uh, as a whole. Therefore, it's an iterative process where we learn, we improve. So we introduce those nuances in the way PHC services is provided, but using data as a platform to learn and improve the quality of service as we uh, as, as we continue to support government and its institution to really use data for decision making. So I think I will stop here and uh, um, maybe my, my affinate colleagues would like to say something then before the Q&A. Over. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that, Yusuf. I'd, I'd love um, for Ugo to now introduce himself. Uh, if you're there, Ugo. Hi, hello everyone. Good morning and good afternoon. So I'm um, Ugo Chukwube from Alphanet. Wonderful, thanks Ugo. Um, it was great to hear um, more about the context of the intervention, Yusuf. Um, and now while we allow the COP to send over some questions, I'd like to ask you both um, about a question of trust, because as you mentioned, Affinet and Gates have worked together in the past. Um, do you have any, any learnings that you'd like to share with, with our community of practice about how you've built up that trust over time? Because as you mentioned, there's a lot of learning to do in this, in this area. So, 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 so I think um, first we, we, we need to look at Affinet as a team. Uh, so Affinet, as a team has been working with CD Foundation for a very long time. They've also been our grantee for some time at, at the, in their individual capacity. Um, so we, we, we implemented a six year project with them to roll out the DHIS2 in Nigeria. That decision was also in, a, in, in, in our attempt and effort to support the government of Nigeria own its data and manage the data platforms in the country. Hitherto, uh, different programs manage different data, and therefore you don't have a centrally managed data in the country. So we felt, I mean, supporting the government to own that process would require the government having a central platform. And as at that time, government has been toiling around the implementation of DHIS2, and it was done in, in bits and pieces. So we funded them to really implement this. Um, CDC Foundation, did a great job through Affinet to really roll this out. And as we speak, the government has transitioned all data reporting to the DHIS2. So based on that and the quality of work that the team, the CDC and Affinet team did, gave us the confidence that uh, we need to go to the next level. What's the next level? The next level is if you roll out the reporting platform, you also need to improve quality of data. Uh, because if the data coming into the platform is not of the right quality, then you will be using the same room data to do 
decision making. And, and so over time, because of the interaction that has happened between us and AFNET and CDC team, we feel that they are a good, a, the right team to really work with. Of course, we acknowledge the fact that HCD is new and they don't have those skill set in their team. And so one of the conversation we had was to see how they could also build their capacity around that. They are expert in the technical data space. But, you know, if you have to win war, in my country, they said you have to work with, with those who live inside the team. So we felt that having been embedded in the team for a very long time, talking about quality of data, but with a specific lens, which we feel is a bit narrow. So using them to do the other layer makes a lot of sense. And that's why we, we felt that they are the right team to really go this hard. And for us, we, we, we also undertook to help them build their internal capacity. And so this, this platform, the CAF conversation is one of them. And there are a host of others, and I'm sure uh, uh, Osige will talk about that over. Absolutely. Sounds like a, a few open discussions. Ugo, did you have anything further to, to share from your perspective about building trust with Gates and having these open discussions? So I think um, he has captured it quite appropriately. So like we had discussions yesterday that building trust happens over time. And then we've been in this um, relationship over time. We've executed other projects before. And I think that has helped to cement that relationship such that we are able to be taxed with this um, new project that looks at not just delivering on the project mandate, but also incorporating learning and an adaptive management at its core. Absolutely. Um, we've actually had a, a very interesting sort of follow-up question from Elizabeth. Elizabeth, would you like to ask your question to both Yusuf and Ugo? Uh, sure, thanks. It was, um, uh, I don't know how much was a question or a reflection, but um, thinking about trust building and relationship building and wondering if Yusuf and Ugo have any thoughts they'd like to share about uh, how to build trust in a virtual environment, knowing that it may be some time before we get back to the opportunity to work together face to face. Yeah, um, you know, um, trust is a very essential commodity, and therefore, sometimes it uh, the truth is it takes a very long time to build. Now, for us in the Gates Foundation, we have this goal we set ourselves to work with local partners that would, would continue to be there, even if we are not around. And so you have to look at the landscape. There are quite a number of very good partners we've been working with. But for every thematic area you work, you need to look at those who have comparative advantage. And so we, we looked at who has the comparative advantage to champion this particular stream of work. And we saw Affinet to be the best fit. But we also acknowledge that the Affinet team has its own weakness. But what endeared Affinet to us is that Affinet acknowledged that weakness. They acknowledge the problem that needs to be addressed. They also acknowledge the fact that, yes, they don't have the internal skill set to look at that dimension. Of course, um, I want to first say that this project we are implementing with them looks at both the technical and behavioral components of data quality. So, uh, and, and we, are, we are implementing both uh, simultaneously. But the behavioral insights we are adopting is new. So we are giving it much deeper attention. So the, the, the affiliate team acknowledge the fact that, yes, this is not their area of strength, but they are happy to work on it. And so if you get a partner that acknowledges its internal weakness and the commitment to say, okay, yeah, this is also a learning curve for our team and it's also a capacity building for our broader team. So for us, that's an incentive for us as a funder to say, yes, these are the right guys to go. So they, they earned our confidence in the fact that one, they know the terrain, they acknowledge the, the weakness in them and the commitment on their part to also build that as something they plan in the long uh, haul for them. Yeah, thank you, Yusuf. I think that, that, that absolutely makes sense and transcends whether 
we're in a virtual or, or physical space, I guess. Um, Ugo, did you have any thoughts um, before? There is a question that I think uh, we can pose to you. Yeah. But so I was, I, was, I was only going to add that, I think he has captured it, but what I was going to add that is that, um, especially because she made reference to the, the virtual space in which we are operating right now. I think it's, it's still possible. The only thing is just like even if it was done as in, you know, in normal situations where you can have face-to-face -face meetings, it's going to take time. And I think that time and that openness of working with one another is what really at the end of the day builds the trust. Over. Absolutely, thank you. Um, now, Vish, I might call on you to, um, to pose your question perhaps to Ugo, um, but of course, Yusuf too, please jump in if you have any thoughts. Well, thank you, Lydia. So, you know, this issue keeps coming up and um, the, the technical side, those of us who value these things, you know, the, the technical nature of these interventions are convinced, um, uh, especially about some, something quote unquote esoteric like data, you know, so. Uh, but how do you, con the, uh, you know, the, uh, as the cliche goes, the chain is as strong as its weakest link. And here, in, especially in terms of data quality, we need really people who are entering this, who are managing throughout the process. There's a process here at the chain. All of them need to be invested in this. So I'm just curious how you have been trying to convince them um, in uh, how important this is, that quality actually matters. It actually makes a difference. Uh, and what are you trying to do to make them invested in this process of quality? You know, so. Because this is not like a typical intervention, right? This is somewhat like data. So. Okay. To go first? Yeah. All right. So thank you very much for this question. And I think um, this is part of the crux of the matter for this intervention, really. So um, we've identified, of course, the behaviors, the attitudes of the healthcare workers has been very important to this, but also importantly, the motivation. So, and, um, so in trying to convince people that quality matters, is to apply some tested strategies that you use when you identify things like learning or motivation as, um, as, as learning gaps. So for the healthcare worker, we understand that for, the, for them not to value what they are doing and therefore for, the quality, for you to appreciate that this, for the quality of what you're doing is important, it starts from showing the evidence that is, if the data is not of good quality, what is the effect? So for those who are primary generators of the data, they are often immune or far away from the effects of this poor quality of data. So part of it for us is going to be taking it down to that level to show the effect of this data, not making it, going, making it something big or very abstract, right there down, breaking it down to that small level, that small community health center, and what the data, what the implication of the data that they generate means for their immediate environment. So I think this is one of the things that we're looking at, and I think we can um, I'll also allow Dr. Yusuf to come in and also share some more light on this, on this question. But this really is at the crux of the matter, and it's one of the things that affects motivation of healthcare workers to be able to collect the data. Of course, if they perceive that the quality, if they perceive that the information that they are gathering or the processes that go into um, data reporting and recording are not um, of value, then definitely they would not, it would definitely lead to poor quality of data. Over. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so for us at the foundation, we are looking also at program performance. Now, if you are looking at program performance, you need to look at how the various levels involved in data generation and utilization and the kind of needs around uh, at those levels. So i.e., the, the person working in the health facility, his data needs to do his day-to-day -day work is different from the policy maker at either the state or the national level who decide around resource allocation 
quality improvement and the rest. So acknowledging this helps us to really begin to look at the various levels and say, okay, each level of care, I mean, each level of the strata in the healthcare system has its own dynamics and its needs. And so for us to look at the program as a whole, we need to look at this uh, across the levels. But most importantly is also to say, each level requires different skill set. Each level also uses different lens to interpret the data that he used for his daily work. So based on this, we look at, that's why we, we, we said the, the two components are really looked at simultaneously and all with the same Vigo, so that, um, because if, if you look at this, the health facility level requires more, um, more behavioral insight because that's where the primary data is being generated. As you go up, there are skills needed to analyze this data, package it for each level of care, I mean, each level of decision making, uh, so that that data is really good for use. Over. Absolutely. Thank you, Yusuf, and, and thank you, Ugo. Um, Vish, if you had any follow up, uh, feel free to jump in. Um, I think David actually did have a similar um, similar question. So David, feel free to, to jump in here too. Thank you very much, Yusuf and Ugo. My challenge is we, we know that the health system is weak and a lot of uh, data problem that we have has to do with the attitude of the, of the, of the staff those who are responsible for it. And I know Ugo has mentioned it, and Yusuf, has, I mean, Yusuf is quite uh, an expert in this area. I, I'm just wondering if this intervention can really lead us to a situation where we are now having uh, data, good, good quality of data in a situation where the health system remains weak. And remember that the health, the, the health workforce is actually central to getting data that is actually very useful for policy making. I don't know what your thought is on this. I'm just wondering if this is really something that will lead us to getting data that is reliable. Yeah, so, so um, uh, Dr. David, you, you, you're right, the health system is weak. But you know, there are two things about data. Um, if you want to improve the quality of data, promote data use. That's one, one, one trick. The more people use data, the more they appreciate the kind of data they need. So if the data they've been using is of poor quality, they will start striving to look for quality data. And, and therefore, for us, if you want to improve the quality of data, you have to work on an assumption. Now, the assumption we are working is that the primary data we get from the health facility, I give you one example from the NDHS. The same facility that report routine immunization also report skill bath attendance. Uh, you will see that facility reaching only 20% of its target, but reporting 100% coverage. But that same facility reaches only 30% uh, of its target under skill bath attendance, but they report 30% or even less than that that same facility. The same facility will report accurate number of antenatal attendance, but this same facility will report poorly on malaria commodities. This same facility will tell you we, we reach 10, we, 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 I mean, we, 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 we serve 10,000 doses of ACT. When in reality, the actual number of clients that came in, in that health facility is only 500. So, so, so you begin to ask question, why? Now, if you confront this healthcare worker with data and say, okay, use this data to plan for your service, you realize that that's when he begin to, you, you, you help him begin to think whether is it the behavior that is consistent that he was deliberately reporting because he's either hiding something or he's under pressure to report to target, or is it because he doesn't have the skills to record adequately? So for me, this is a huge learning curve because we're addressing two fundamental problems at the same time. And I think this is what will, will one, promote data, uh, I mean, improvement in data quality and use, but also help in strengthening the system also. Over. Thank you. 
Thank you, Yusuf. Um, we're, we've actually run out, that session went so fast. Um, thank you so much for all the engagement. I would like to just say, um, Ritika made a, a, a great comment just saying evidence speaks. How the evidence is being used to improve programs objectively is something that needs to be communicated and donors would support. Um, so just a very interesting uh, comment there from Ritika. Um, but thank you very much, Ugo and Yusuf, uh, for such an engaging session. Um, it was great to hear more about your program, even though I'm working with you both quite, quite a lot, but it's great to have a conversation about it. I'm now going to hand over to Professor Vish Viswanath uh, for some concluding remarks and some news on the curve. So thank you, Vish.